good morning, everyone. I am so glad that you made it through the snowy weather up the hill to the Persimmon Country Club. I had a chance to meet the new owner of Persimmon, and I'm supposed to let all of you know, we're, we're getting a little feedback up here, I'm supposed to let all of you know that it's not going to be a public golf course, course anytime soon, but maybe by next weekend. So that's the news that he gave us this week. Um, several of you um, were here at the last BLT, and I mentioned at that last, last time that I had a black bear that showed up at my house again, and you wanted an update about the black bear. I've asked for three days off this summer so that I can start my cookbooks, how to slow cook bear meat. So that's the new, that's the update. And of course, I'm kidding, this is being recorded again. Uh, I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Portland General Electric and Riverview Community Bank. So Portland General Electric is here in force today, literally, and thank you so much. Dean, thank you for your sponsorship. And Riverview Community Bank is also a presenting sponsor. I want to thank our stakeholder sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District, and we're honored today. She doesn't always, um, isn't always able to attend because she is very busy. But Dr. Catrice Pereira, Dr. Catrice Pereira is here today with Gresham Barlow School District. They are a sponsor. Thank you so much. We have a media sponsor. Yes, they have showed up and have made sure that we look good and sound good. Metro East Community Media, and on your way out, you can pick up a flyer and find out when the rebroadcast is going to occur for the uh, BLT that we're having today. Keith, thanks for coming and for bringing somebody else to help you. I didn't realize this was that complicated, that you needed two people, but thanks for doing that today. We'd also like to um, recognize any elected officials that are here today. So if you're school board or state office or county or city, if you'd like to stand up so we can congratulate and thank all of you for your public service at the same time. Thank you for doing that. Did Kirk sneak out? Yeah, we'll have him stand up when he gets back in. Okay. And I would be foolish to not recognize my bosses that are here in the room. We have several board members that are here. Warner Allen, past president. Thank you, Warner, for being here. And our president-elect, Jim Hathaway, is here. Thank you, Jim, from Transamerica Financial Advisors. Warner Allen, by the way, is an attorney at Warren Allen LLP. Ding Funk, one of our newest board members, took John Maloney's place, barely. Um, but we're really grateful that you're here and have joined us, Dean. <laughs> Steve Brown from Pamplin Media is here. Steve, there you are. Hi, Steve. Steve, you're not eating today? I'm done. Oh, done eating. You're waiting to see if there's going to be enough for later. Thank you for, for, for being here. And we also have one of our newer board members from the Comfort Inn, Lori Harrell. Lori is here today. Thank you, Lori. She's, this is, is this your first BLT? Yes. It's going to be a good one. So um, many of you know that I do the table decorations to save you money on your membership dues. And you can tell I didn't go to any great expense today. Kurt, you're going to know this. The president of the council just walked in. You're going to know that I am very thrifty with my table decorations. And so a couple of people said, what is this? And many of you know I have a garden center background. And you immediately thought that I was suggesting that you buy bulbs to plant. <laughs> no. 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 Okay, I know, cha-ching. Okay, so the, actually, um, I looked at that and I thought, it looks like green energy to me. Or maybe great ideas. And that is what we're about to witness with who is um, our guest speaker today. When I was in the legislature several years ago, there was some what I would consider extremists that were on a bandwagon to take down every single dam on the Columbia River. Man. Now, I don't know if they're still working on that plan or not, but I can assure you that Persimmon would have beachfront property available if they would have gotten their wishes at that time. But what we do know is that PGE constantly in their entire existence has needed to navigate through many different philosophies and viewpoints and at the same time deliver an affordable product. With that being said, I would like to welcome on stage the president of the chairman, excuse me, of our Government Affairs Council, the president of PGG Construction Services, Brian Lessler, to introduce our speaker. Brian? Thank you. Oh, I 
Well, good afternoon. It is by a couple of minutes in any event. I'm glad to see such a great turnout. For more than 125 years, Portland General Electric has been powering the pioneering spirit of our region, keeping energy safe, reliable, and responsibly generated. They are deeply committed to the success of the communities they serve and strive to bring innovative solutions to their customers and a bright energy future for Oregon. They have been pioneers in leadership appointments as well. On July 26, 2017, Maria Pope was appointed by PGE's Board of Directors to succeed Jim Pirro in the role of president. Pope took on the role of president and a short five months later on January 1, 2018, assumed the role of CEO and member of the board when Jim Pirro officially retired. <clears throat> Prior to her selection as CEO, Pope served as senior vice president of power supply operations and resource strategy. That's a pretty big title in and of itself. <laughs> so what did she do? She oversaw PGE's energy supply portfolio and operations, including wholesale power, fuels, marketing, trading, and long-term resource strategy. But that's not all. In addition, she had responsibility for uh, generation facilities, including 15 thermal, hydro, and wind facilities. I don't suspect there was much spare time in that job description. Prior to joining PGE in 2009, Pope was chief financial officer for a little company down south called Mentor Graphics Corporation. Uh, that's down in kind of my new hood these days. And she served in senior operations and finance positions uh, within the forest products uh, industry at Pope and Talbot and consumer products industries at Levi Strauss. And she began her career in banking with Morgan Stanley. Pretty impressive background. She was appointed by uh, the governor uh, of the state of Oregon to chair the Oregon Health Sciences University Governing Board and she is an alumni of the Stanford Graduate School of Business and earned her bachelor's degree from Georgetown University. All in all, I'd say Ms. Pope is pretty much a super achiever. I guess the bottom line is she keeps the lights on. <laughs> Please welcome the CEO of PGE, my very old friend, that I met about 10 minutes ago, Maria Pope. Thank you. No, that needs to come down here. Oh. Yes, ma'am. You come down. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Before I start, I'd like to recognize a couple of elected leaders who are here today. Uh, Carla. Um, Peluso, you get, we, also of uh, Gresham City Council, uh, Kirk French, and we have with us also today Mount Hood Community College President Deborah Durr. Deborah, I think you just snuck in. Oh, there she is. Thank you for being with us today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to lead a company like PGE that has such a strong history uh, in our region. Uh, I grew up in Portland. Uh, I was uh, born at Emanuel Hospital 53 years ago and spent much of my early childhood admiring Lynn, who was then, I think, Miss Oregon. I then went on a little bit later to admire Lynn, who was uh, running state government and Speaker of the House. Uh, and it's, a, it's really a, an honor to be able to be in a state where we've had such strong female leaders and who have been such examples uh, to myself and, and to others. So thank you for having us here today. As I look back over the past year, I've had an opportunity to spend time with our elected leaders, 
uh, with our customers, uh, in particular with Shane Bemis uh, of Gresham and others, really listening to what you all want of your utility and how we should be serving you best. I want to make sure that PG is focused on delivering customer value and on making sure that we hear what you want from our, your utility supplier and the services we provide. These are really interesting times and in particular we have cities and communities, counties who want to be 100% green as quickly as possible. We have the governor's electric vehicle uh, focus by 2020 to have 50,000 electric cars on the road. And we have an overall consensus within our state and the region around carbon, global warming, and overall concern around the planet's climate. We also at PGE are firmly committed to meeting Oregon's carbon reduction goals. And this is 80% below 2000, oh, excuse me, 1990 levels by 2050. And on your table is our clean energy vision paper that we put together that I hope you will take with you uh, and take a quick look at. Move the slide. PGE has a history of over 100, almost 130 years of serving Oregonians, and we've been serving Gresham for, since 1890. Uh, we serve 50% of the state's population and 75% of the industrial and commercial activity. And today, the Portland metro area, believe it or not, is one of the fastest growing regions in the entire country. We are number three for immigration. And at 32 construction cranes, we are the highest per capita crane city or region in the entire country uh, of all of those who report their populations versus the number of construction cranes. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, uh, it's, and I think we all feel that in terms of traffic and as our state evolves and, in ch and changes. Um, our primary objectives as a utility have not changed, but they are evolving. Uh, we remain dedicated to safety, reliability, and making sure that our cost of power is affordable for all. At PTE, safety is a core value of what we do. And sometimes we forget, but truly, the product that we produce, transmit, and deliver can kill people. And so we take safety as one of our very highest priorities. It really trumps everything else that we do every day at PGE. And it's safety for my coworkers and all of us at PGE in this room with whom we work. It's safety for our customers and it's safety from everyone in the community who comes in contact with our poles and wires and substations. We also know that reliability matters. And it matters more so today than it ever has before as technology develops and we all are attached to our smart devices. And then thirdly, we're ever mindful that we serve everyone in our communities. And over 20% of our customers struggle to pay their bills every day. They make trade-offs with their utility bills versus medicine for elderly people and their families, or maybe even clothing for their children. And so it's something that we're ever conscious about in terms of being affordable and cost-effective. And we also know that many businesses, electricity is one of your largest costs. And particularly for those businesses that compete internationally, we're ever mindful that we have to earn your business every day. At PGE, we're guided by a strong sense of Oregonian values. We're one of the largest employers in the state. And JD Power, um, the organization that ranks customer organizations, has noted that we are the number one utility for business customer satisfaction of any utility in the West something we don't take lightly. We also care tremendously about our communities. And our employees and retirees volunteered 42,000 hours in 2017. And in combination with the PG Foundation, we gave over three and a half million dollars to community organizations and schools across the state. So our energy landscape is changing, and I think it's why there's so many of you here today. I noted that safety, reliability, and affordability has been key to our service over the last 130 years. 
but today being clean and carbon free is important and also being secure. This means being, having systems that are free from cyber and physical attacks and resilient when it comes to natural disasters. Ensuring that we deliver to you the ongoing reliability that you've come to expect from all of us. Electricity is the cleanest form of energy today. And we're blessed in a region to have more hydropower than probably any other parts of the country. And as Lynn noted, it's something that we don't take lightly. We also, for those of you who spent time driving through the gorge, have noticed that we have rapidly growing amount of wind energy and other renewables on our system. We even see a utility scale solar, as well as new technologies like wave energy. And we have increasing amounts of distributed energy. Even in the cloudy Pacific Northwest, we have ever increasing amounts of people who want solar uh, panels on their rooftops. At PGE, we're 40% carbon free, which is about 30% ahead of the national average. We expect to continue to be leaders as we expand our 25% hydro um, energy, as well as our 15% wind energy and growing amounts of solar. I mentioned the importance that electricity plays in the overall energy sector. The energy sector is about $1.2 trillion and represents about 8% of our economy. Of this, the electricity sector is about $275 million, or 23% today. And that's expected to grow significantly over the next couple of decades to 40% by 2040 and 50% by 2050. Key drivers include the rapid chase of rapid pace, excuse me, of technological change as well as distributed energy. And transportation will be a key driver in all of this. In fact, coming over here today, uh, Dean noted to me that he was thinking about buying an electric car and we're sitting next to a Tesla owner t at our table. So Volvo, believe it or not, will be producing only electric vehicles by 2020. And you'll see that by 2040, about a third to half of all vehicles sold will probably be electric. And the reason for this is that the transportation sector is now the most carbon intensive sector in our economy. Yet just yesterday, a couple of us were visiting with the TriMet executive leadership team working on their vision over the next 20 years of how they electrify the transportation system, namely buses, and in particular talking about their development plans for the Powell Street bus depot and the Division Street area. Really exciting opportunities as we move forward. PGE was among the first in the nation to conduct a study on economy-wide deep decarbonization. Those are really big words. And we hired nationally renowned experts, Evolved Energy Research, who was also hired by the US government to create the deep decarbonization study that was presented recently at the United Nations. They're nationally recognized experts on the energy sector and on the impacts of climate change. And they identified three key areas for, as pathways towards a clean energy future. The first being the decarbonization of the energy sector, and we'll go on to talk a little bit more about that. Electrification, displacing other carbon producing fuels, and then enabling smarter ways to use energy. Continuing Oregon's and PGE's longstanding um, conservation areas as we work to reduce carbon across our system. These challenges and the integration of new technologies adds greater variability and complexity. But this is work that those of us at PGE love to do. So the first area to focus on is generating electricity from renewable resources. As Oregon's largest electric supplier, we play an important role here. And as this chart shows, we're targeting being more than 80% below greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. This is just ahead of the state's decarbonization goals. 
One of the ways that we're planning on doing this is in two, just, just took place about six months ago, in October 1st, 2017. We joined as the fifth utility in the West an a energy imbalance market which spans Arizona, Nevada, California, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and now even British Columbia in a west-wide electrical grid that allows each of our 15 plants to be dispatched on a five-minute basis automatically out of Folsom, California. And what that allows for is it allows for the most cost-effective resources to be used. And since the sun doesn't charge when it shines and powers solar panels in California and Arizona, and the wind doesn't charge when it blows, wind turbines in our own Columbia Gorge area, it's those renewable resources that are dispatched first, with then the carbon emitting thermal resources that burn fuel dispatched after that to only balance when Mother Nature isn't showing up or it's dark at night. It's really important for us to integrate west-wide so that it, like on a, today, a day like today, when it's a little cloudy in Oregon, but it's sunny in California, they're generating actually excess solar energy that we can purchase for customers at very low and sometimes zero cost as it's access to their system. And, this, and the instantaneous nature and automation that now takes place allows this to take place seamlessly every five minutes. We have a long tradition in Oregon about caring about the environment, and 20% of our utility, of our customers at the utility actually buy power in our renewable voluntary program. It's the number one program in the country, and not just by a little bit, but by quite a bit. We're also closing the Boardman Coal Plant in 2020, and with the support of Shane Bemis and other mayors across the region, we have just filed with the Oregon Public Utility Commission for 100% green energy product for new renewable generation resources. And if the mayor were here, we would thank him. Um, please know that his help and others made our being able to get this filing done. And so without elected officials such as Shane, it would not have been possible. As we move on to the second path, which is electrification, there's a number of cities and businesses that I mentioned have set ambitious goals of being 100% renewable, and we're committed to helping them achieve those goals. Energy efficiency and the adoption of new technologies is an example. And, for, and in particular, the Gresham Wastewater Treatment Plant, which you all are very familiar with, was the first energy net zero plant of its kind in the Pacific Northwest. And in partnership with the Energy Trust of Oregon and with assistance from PGE, the city now produces its own renewable energy from biogas and solar. And you save over more than half a million dollars a year, which allows you to put those funds to other city services. And also kudos to the Gresham Barlow School District and in particular to Catrice Pereira. Where did you go? There you go. Truly remarkable, winning the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Energy Star Leader Award for teaching students for more than a decade about saving energy and truly changing behavior through their resource conservation and management program. An exceptional example, not only in Oregon, but to the rest of the country. And then third, the path to modernizing our grid to be smarter and more resilient. Creating a smart, two-way, bi-directional flow of electricity that will help us integrate renewables and customer generation. This area is expected to grow threefold over the next decade or two as demand response and significant growth in energy storage technology takes place. We expect to see the deployment of batteries accelerate with the drop in battery costs. And a smarter grid will allow us to manage the greater complexity with this system and bring better optimization through the entire system, all the way from that utility scale, west-wide flow of electrons, all the way down to our own local level. But security and resiliency is also important. And attention to critical infrastructure protection 
is increasingly helpful as we are looking at increased amounts of cyber and physical attacks on our system. And in particular, the cyber attacks are escalating exponentially. But we also know that we live in the Cascadia subduction zone, and we have to be prepared for natural disasters such as earthquakes. So one of the questions I get is, what is a smart grid? And what does it really mean? And what we're talking about is helpful in understanding first what is maybe the current grid that we have look like. And traditionally, we have large central station generation sources, be they hydro facilities, wind farm, natural gas plants. And they generate power that's then transmitted over power lines through substations and distribution lines into your homes. And in the future, we will see two-way flows of electrons, and it will be largely automated because it will happen so seamlessly and at such levels, the only way to do it is through automation and through data collection. This gives us real-time communications and automations to meet demand and prioritize green energy and lower costs. It'll allow us to tap into customer-owned solar panels, other customer-owned renewables, even maybe the battery in a Tesla car. It'll also allow us to have backup and dispatchable standby generation, which we already have one of the larger programs, which includes many customers such as hospitals, some large manufacturers, and others. And one of the visions that we have is that the hundreds and thousands of electric water heaters that we have in our area also source as a, as a place for storage um, on the system. We started this actually a number of years ago, and this vision really isn't anything new. When I first joined the company almost 10 years ago, we were in the middle of putting in 875,000 smart meters which automatically read energy usage across all of our customers and allows us to tie into systems for automatic uh, dispatch of our line crews and others when we have outages. And believe it or not, but just yesterday, we went through, we just cut over to a brand new information technology system that will take all of that meter data and combine it automatically through our billing system and through other customer systems. It's actually one of the more complex corporate kinds of IT systems there is. And it's important that we're automated as we talk about the instantaneous flow of all these electrons and connecting the distribution system with that generally utility-wide scale. And one of the reasons is, is because communities like yourself want to be smart. And this actually is a picture of what may be the Broadway corridor and the old post office building in Portland. But imagine a world where it's fully electric, it's integrated into the smart community, and that energy and data flows automatically and instantaneously. In particular, you might have smart street lights that not only save electricity, but provide data to law enforcement to help our overall communities. We also will see not only electric vehicles, but potentially autonomous vehicles. And we'll have access to that virtually free excess California and Arizona solar energy. This is not really a destination, but a journey. And every community and municipality like Gresham is on their own path, which fits your own needs. So in conclusion, I just want to make sure that you recognize that PGE is a company that's leaning in. We're forward looking to this clean energy future and a reduced carbon footprint. We're excited about integrating new technologies and have a history of doing so. We also connect that to very real equipment and generating resources. And it's important that we keep it equitable and affordable for all, ensuring universal access. Electricity is vital to our economy, our region's safety, and the lives of our citizens and our customers, as well as the overall health of our communities. At our core, we exist to ensure universal access and universal equity and affordability as we move forward. So with that, I'd like to take anyone's questions. Lynn, how much longer would you 
like to go? I have an appointment at two. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, you have to leave um, about five minutes to one, so we'll okay. wrap up way before that. Okay. Um, Mr. Brown, did you have a question? You need to have this uh, microphone with you, though. Hi, thanks. Um, I appreciate what you're doing, what your company is doing for sustainability and for reducing the carbon footprint. However, I have this um, sort of selfish question. Um, I'm one of the people who lived in Eastern Oregon for many, many, many years, and uh, I'm probably one of the few people who really appreciates the view of the high desert out in Eastern Oregon. Can you please stop building? Windmills. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not sure that was a question. Just, uh, <laughs> just to clarify. He owns a lot of ink that goes on a lot of papers. So I want you to pre pre prepared. Um, you know, it's interesting in terms of Eastern Oregon. So we serve about six counties. Um, in terms of Oregon, in terms of our electrical service. But we actually generate power and are present in over 15 counties. Uh, and in particular, in Eastern Oregon, uh, Boardman is located in Morrill County. We have two other natural gas facilities. Um, and then we have a wind farm um, t uh, in the Columbia Gorge region uh, near Rufus, uh, which was actually built in three phases beginning about Oh, 2007, later 2009, then 2010, or each of the three phases. Most recently, we built a wind farm in eastern Washington, um, and just outside of Walla Walla. What you'll see a lot as we are looking towards building additional renewable resources is that they're most likely going to be built on already cultivated land. And the reason for that is environmental and there happen to be less uh, ground squirrels in areas that are already cultivated. So you'll continue to probably see uh, more growth in terms of wind energy, in terms of solar, but it will be on areas largely already developed and largely agricultural. Um, one of the issues we also have is making sure that we're able to transmit all of that power uh, back and forth. So I don't know if that addressed your question, but I think you'll see more of it in times to come. It, one of the things that what people don't appreciate is the solar density in eastern Oregon is so much greater than it is on the west side of the state, and the wind also blows a lot more. So there's a natural reason why we're attracted to your area. So Steve, I can help you with that Photoshop thing, and you can take them all out of the pictures if you need to. <laughs> um, I, yeah, People are laughing because they know I'm not a very good digitally. So another question while Maria is here. It's a, a wonderful, I think, a wonderful asset to a company when somebody has public as well as private experience. So Maria, uh, when, when Brian introduced her, we talked about Pope and Talbot, um, Mentor Graphics. So she has that background and being able to make decisions that a public and private enter, entity um, with that brain uh, experience, if you will, is really powerful. Did you have a question? Here, wait, you have to wait for this. Yeah, so I'm, tr I'm trying to get the connection, a uh, better understanding of the connection between natural gas and electricity. So you mentioned that you have natural gas plants, but then sometimes we have natural gas to our house and we cook with natural gas mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, in your view, with a totally electric city, that natural gas would go away, so if we're building a new house or something, we should build it all electric as opposed to natural gas because natural gas is going away and we're going to be an all electric city? Or how can so, you advise us in that? Sure. Uh, first of all, I don't think natural gas is going to go away anytime too soon. Um, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, customers still want to make sure they have cost effective power. And we have some ab ability to store power through the federal hydro system or let's say through the Deschutes system that PGE operates in conjunction with the Warm Springs tribe um, in Bend Madras area. Um, what, when, you, when you burn a natural gas at a power plant, it's much more efficient than when I burn natural gas in my stove at home. And so in terms of the efficient use of that carbon molecule, generating electricity is probably the most efficient use versus the distribution of natural gas through all of our system. 
I would also say, though, that PGE is one of the largest buyers of natural gas in the entire state of, of Oregon. And we do that to be able to balance all of the renewables on our, on our system. Uh, Northwest Natural is actually our, uh, one of our main suppliers in that. And we're just finishing up a project that they're actually constructing for us um, in the Klatskanai area near the coast, where they are storing natural gas in the ground and then as you need it for when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, it flows out of that storage and we're able to run the power plants very effectively rather than just relying on the interstate pipeline. So to a certain extent, natural gas and electricity are connected, but it's much more efficient in terms of the use of all of our uh, fuel is that it, if it is mostly electric. Catrice? I do have a middle school principal's voice, so. <laughs> Okay, um, so my question is this, um, you know, scientists all over the world are looking for ways to uh, build more efficient um, products for energy renewable, et cetera. Um, and in our district, we are fortunate enough to have passed a $300 million bond recently. So we're able to revamp some of our CTE programs. So actually it's not a question, but an ask. <laughs> I'm an educator, so I have to do this right on behalf of my students, right? I'm, I am shameless, right? My board member, one of my board members is here. I am. So what, what I'm getting at is that we are looking to redesign some of our CTE programs. And one of those things is obviously the automotive piece. Mm -hmm. But I think more than just repairing cars, um, I know our students in my ask and my time with them have spent, they want to know about building lightweight electrical cars, right, as opposed to just so my ask is, is there a way or someone in PGE that I can speak to on behalf of my students to help support such a program in our district? Absolutely. Uh, and Perfect. we will connect you to the right people. We are not necessarily car designers or manufacturers of cars. Uh, but the fuel cells, we know a lot about that technology. We own just about 100 charging stations in the region. And with the help of um, many of you here and other elected officials, we were able to get through a program to put in six electric avenues and actually a pilot project we have with TriMet to transform one of their bus lines into an all-electric route. So this very much is where things are going in the future. I would also say that as a company, and particularly my predecessor, Jim Pyro, was dedicated towards um, technical education. He's passionate about engineering and promoting education at the very youngest ages so that by the time students get to you, they have a vision of where they might want to go with their careers and some dedication. We also are spending a lot of time with our, the unions that we work with on making sure that people who don't necessarily want to take an engineering path have a path through the trades. Uh, PGE hires and has terrific jobs in the trades um, that are family wage um, jobs, require a lot of uh, technical skills. Um, and one of the things actually that Mayor Bemis and I were talking about is bringing some of our linemen out to your schools to visit with your kids so they can see the great example in the people that we're hiring and who have actually also worked with our company for sometimes two, three, four decades who are really exceptional. Dr. Pereira, if if uh, Maria suggests that you talk to Dean about that transportation issue, that lightweight thing that you're talking about is a bicycle. He uh, <laughs> does 3,000 miles a year on his little lightweight, solar-powered, like solo-powered um, <laughs> vehicle. So another question? Yes. Leslie? Um, thank you so much. It's very interesting. One question I have when it comes to electricity that I don't think that I completely understand is the storage. Mm -hmm. As far as the difference between wind and what goes through the dams and because I have this feeling it's made and then it's gone. And I don't know where the reality between those two exists. Certainly, absolutely. And it's a, it's a great question. I think it's what makes the utility industry and what we do kind of interesting and sometimes sort of a hat trick. Is that all of you are familiar with 60 megahertz? 
And one of the things we have to do with the, system, with the electric system on both a bulk electric west-wide basis, but also all the way down to the service into your house, is that essentially the puts and the takes, the generation and the consumption, has to equal one another all the time. So when we talk about storage, when we talk about storage at scale, what we're generally talking about is storing water behind a dam and then flowing that water through turbines later on. What we also will talk about is, so is early battery technology. Batteries, though, are pretty small scale for the kind of system that we run, and right now they're relatively expensive. We expect those costs, just like solar panels have come down the last, dec last decade, we expect the battery cost to come down. But right now you can't store a lot of uh, energy in a battery system. Maybe you could put a, batter a Tesla battery in your house, and that might allow you to have two or not, th uh, maybe three hours of energy if the lights had gone on after that. But it's, it's relatively small scale. They're working towards getting to eight hours or even longer. Um, electric vehicle storage and the small scale like that really has gotten to a level where it's deployable now at a cost effective level. And I think what we saw is early rolling out by Toyota and others um, uh, with regards to electric uh, vehicles, that will begin to take off um, in spades. Um, so large scale storage still really eludes us unless it's through the hydro system. What we do do though is then we ramp up our plants up and down. And now we ramp them up and down in concert with every other generating unit on the west coast. So I'll go back to one of my op opening comments. I'll get to you Brian, no, opening comments about the folks that were trying to take every dam down off of the Columbia River. Well, imagine what that would do to PGE if they couldn't make those turbines store that power. And then, you know, Persimmon would be happy because they'd have beachfront property, but <laughs> not, not so much. Brian? Thank you, Lynn. Uh, you mentioned the growth uh, that's going on in the metro area in terms of population. I'm one of those guys that's responsible for towers sometimes. And what we've recognized uh, is that the infrastructure that's in place is frequently in conflict with the vertical uh, construction process that we engage in to house people. Um, we found that in order to work with the engineering divisions, we have to start months, many months sometimes, at the very earliest stages of design in order to get resolution to that because they're so stacked up, there's so much demand. What challenges do you have in terms of augmenting or adding to uh, that engineering staff to help uh, the construction industry move forward more effectively? So um, this is, for the, for the people in the room, this is an area where uh, we have really not done as good of a job as we should have. Uh, going back a couple of years ago, we got surprised by the very rapid uh, takeoff of our economy and the, and the amount of growth. About the same time, we had a number of people retire in our organization. And it takes a while to hire system engineers, to hire additional linemen. And today, actually, we are down 30 linemen in our area, having really hired a lot of people. In particular, we have doubled the number of people we have in our system design area. Uh, and we have doubled some other departments. So our growth has gone quite up quite substantially in the last two years. We should have grown sooner, and we shouldn't have gotten ourselves into a situation that we did. None of us, I think, expected uh, Portland to be one of the fastest growing areas. And then the out outlying areas, all the way from Hillsborough to Gresham, um, and all the way up to Mount Hood, you know, it may not have as many office towers and things, but the residential development and others that we're seeing has been extensive. And is, um, it's no longer caught us surprise because we're, by, because we're addressing it, but it is something that we were slow to recognize in terms of the depth of the amount of change in our area. Um, and I, I hope that you've seen an improvement. I would say that every time we touch things, particularly in older communities, we get surprised ourselves by what we find. Uh, we found underground caverns, no, I joke, um, I don't joke about this in terms of what we found in vaults uh, downtown and other things like that. 
um, pretty significant um, uh, number of water pipes and water mains that were not in any plans. Uh, and so everything that we touch uh, is a little bit of, a, of an investigation process. Um, now obviously that's not taking place in more rural areas in Damascus or maybe the outer parts of Gresham uh, or Hillsborough, but certainly uh, we're seeing it in the inner core of, of cities and it's been a really big deal. I would also say that we've struggled and tried to work much more collaboratively with communities large and small on permitting to make sure that we're able to work during the day um, and not get kicked just to the evenings because that puts additional stress on already not being able to have enough linemen in our area. You should know that we're not the only ones who are short of, on the technical trades right now. Uh, Bonneville Power Administration is down even more uh, number of linemen and they primarily have transmission linemen. It's a little bit more complex job and every utility across the country is looking for people right now. So this is a big area. Thank you for your patience. Good job opportunity. Yeah. It's a great job opportunity. <laughs> Marie, <laughs> did, before we go there, did we lose some linemen due to some longer term uh, hurricane disaster recovery areas too? That's, that's a what really I was good point. Told. I will tell you that that's hot money. Um, yeah. And you not only can work long hours during those projects, uh, but they pay very well. You're absolutely right. And we're beginning to see many, we sometimes hire people from um, different parts of the country. Most of our linemen have grown up in our communities and want to stay here. Uh, but for the first time, we're also seeing shortages of people in some of the PUDs. And that's something that we had not seen before. So there was another question someplace, Warner? And then you. Sorry. So um, I recall somebody telling me once that transmission lines are fairly inefficient in transporting um, electricity, that there's a lot of loss of energy in that process. Is that correct? And if it is correct, what is being done from an engineering standpoint to improve uh, the transmission of electricity? Sure. Um, so I think the question is around inefficiencies of the system. And the question is, I think it's not just our transmission lines inefficient, because you certainly do have some line losses. And over time, we have done a number of things to reduce uh, line losses. But the question is also, I think, getting at where should your efficiencies exist? And one of the things that's uh, really popular today is the concept of distributed energy and everyone having their own generator or their own windmills on top of buildings and things like that. And believe it or not, but that's much less efficient and more inefficient than any of the line losses you'd see. We see line losses depending on the time of year. They're just a couple of percentage points. But you start with that very large generation that generally is extremely efficient because it's at scale. And then so that makes up for any of the line losses um, by quite some distance. So we've got time for two more questions. Here's one. Thank you. Uh, I noticed in your presentation a mention of demand response mm -hmm. for home heating and cooling. Uh, obviously being in the industry, I'm familiar with that. All of our uh, heat pump systems that are coming out now, the higher end models have that, although we're not using it. Uh, I was just curious in the Portland market, um, are they looking at uh, implementing that down the road? Or? So we are, as a company, and every all of my coworkers at PG will tell you, we love heat pumps. Uh, so we think that they're uh, the way to go in terms of taking care of your home. Uh, and we have heat pump programs and, and talk about them quite significantly. There are programs in other dis jurisdictions and the ETO, the Energy Trust of Oregon also helps with those. But you're, you're absolutely right. And in terms of demand response, this is an area that is sort of has a double-edged sword. Uh, we have more demand response than other utilities do in the Pacific Northwest, but we have relatively low energy costs, where you see very high demand response programs are in areas where you tend to have higher costs of electricity. Where demand response or, or distributed generation, both kinds of programs really help is some of our larger industrial customers. And and particularly those that were being commodity businesses, let's say paper manufacturing, pulp manufacturing, steel, others, those that can curtail their operations and then during peak periods sell back electricity to us, or in times when we are having a reliability event, let's say we lost a transmission line or you lost a generating plant, and they're willing to curtail their operations to provide reliability to the grid. 
we pay those customers for that service uh, and that interruption of their businesses, and that frequently helps their operations financially. And for some of those commodity businesses, that's very, very important to their survival. That's a great question. Any last question? Maria, when you're in your electric car on your way to work in the morning and you put your electric toothbrush sound, you're not brushing your teeth anymore, you're headed to work, what is the most, what do you look forward to the most when you get there? Is it, is it getting ready for speeches like this? Is it dealing with the negotiation on power? Is it getting to know the people in Arizona that you're going to get to buy stuff from? Or what do you look forward to when you're going to work in the morning? I mean, goodness sakes, you're going to have this job for what, 40 more years? You're really young, so, <laughs> so what do you look forward to? You know, I work with some of the greatest, most dedicated, purpose-driven people that I have ever worked with in my career. Um, and we deal with complex problems that matter. Uh, and they matter to, not only to you all in the room, they matter not only to businesses that are providing employment and a great economy for our region, uh, but they, they matter to um, you know, kids who are growing up today. And to be able to work with the coworkers that I'm able to at PGE to bring the right kinds of solutions. As, as Lynn noted, there's a lot of opinions on our business. And by seeking all of that advice and those opinions, we're able to come to good solutions. We're not always speedy. What we do, it results in power plants that are built in the ground and generation facilities that are in wind turbines on people's farms and power uh, lines that may go past your homes. We take that, those, very, those decisions very seriously and we sometimes make time and take time in making them. But we have, a, we have a philosophy in our company that stems back from our guiding behaviors that was rolled out probably 25 years ago. And that is, is that we're really trying to do the right thing every day in delivering power for our customers. So that's what makes me happy every day. So thank you for the question. Let's give, Gresh let's give a Gresham well, thank you to Maria Pope. Maria, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So did you know me in the legislature? You did? Mm -hmm. You did. But you'll keep of Lynn Stature, I knew more of Lynn than knew you personally. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Um, you just seem so young too. That was like twenty years ago. It was the Y two K. I was a speaker during the Y two K and I was almost hoping for something to happen because they had special police. They knew where I was on New Year's Eve. I had to be sober. I mean it was a pretty it was an interesting concept because if you know, if the governor goes and the Secretary of State goes and the President of the Senate goes and I don't know, the janitor down floor eventually it'd get to me and I would have been the governor. And so I was thinking, you know, Y two K, come on, that would be really fun. But nothing happened. It was boring, and we made up for it the next day. So, <laughs> literally. Okay, so I want to thank again our, span our sponsors. Portland General Electric, Dean, thank you very much. And thanks for joining the board. We appreciate you. And Riverview Community Bank, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. Just as a reminder, um, you'll get to see Maria again if you pick up one of these flyers for the rebroadcast with Metro East. Um, we did not put any... Any, um, what are those called? Surveys. Surveys on your table because we got lazy this time and decided not to do that. But if you have comments about this particular one and you want to email me about this, you liked it, you didn't, here's another speaker idea. How can I get a hold of Maria to write her a thank you note? Be sure and do that. We appreciate that. Maria said she loves the people she works with. I love the people I work with. Shelly did triple duty today. Shelly, thank you so much for making sure that that video worked and you took the money today and you got Keith all set up. Thank you for what you do. Our next BLT is it's going to be very, very interesting. It's um, June 19th, the third Tuesday of the month, just like normal, and it's featuring the Gresham Police Captain Claudio Grandjean. It's all about body cameras. Help or hurdle? So be sure and come, and you're going to hear a Gresham resident who's been with the Gresham Police for a very long time. They're getting uh, potentially a grant for body cameras and I have a lot of questions about it. Um, we've all been impacted on the news media with that. So be sure and come. Maria, thank you again very much for putting us on your schedule. And you're welcome to Gresham anytime. It doesn't have to be just to say nice things about our mayor. There are other people here that, that really appreciate you. With that being said, you're dismissed. <laughs>
Thank you.